just to give you a flavor of the Duncan brand transformation strategy. In 1996, average weekly sales were about $9,500 or about a half a million dollars a year the typical donut shop was generating. And over the course of the next six years, we grew that to 15,500, focusing on coffee excellence, repositioning the chain from donut oriented to coffee oriented. So that was big, the introduction of bagels, the introduction of uh, additional beverages, culottas, the fo frozen coffee beverage uh, allowed us to uh, significantly increase sales over that time frame. Now, uh, in 1996, I became chief operating officer for both Dunkin' Donuts and Baskin Robbins and began addressing Baskin Robbins' needs. Our thrust was really to clean up stores, contemporize them, lower the cost of ice cream to our franchisees uh, by virtue of outsourcing the manufacturing to Dean Foods and converting the stores from royalty. Our experience with co-branding Duncan and Baskin was modestly successful, but led us to conclude that since these brands operated in narrow segments, Duncan primarily the breakfast segment, Baskin primarily the snack segment, and since 50% of the quick service restaurant business is at lunch, that we needed you know, a lunch brand. Hence the acquisition of Togo's, which was a California sandwich brand, not unlike Quiznos, but just on a smaller scale. So that led us to put three brands under the roof. Uh, a couple of examples you see here. One was in Sacramento, California. This particular slide uh, indicates that the opening day we did $10,000 and the one in Bayside, New York, uh, $8,000. So that was the sort of three brands under the roof uh, strategy. Our, our mission that you see depicted here was that we were the world's best and most loved QER brands. Now we competed in the QSR quick service restaurant segment, it used to be called fast food. They decided to upscale it to quick service restaurants. We saw ourselves a little bit differently, quick emotional rewards. So our mission then, driven off of that vision, was really the reason for our existence. Why do we exist? Why do we get up every day? What drives us? That was to thrill customers, to define and lead multi-branding, enrich all stakeholders, that's the consumer, our uh, employees, our franchisees, and the stockholder, and to build powerful brands. The values that we focused on inside our corporation were integrity, the people in the system that I talked about, consumers, franchisees, employees, connecting them, connecting them to each other, to the vision, to the mission. Innovation was big in our culture. We set a goal for having sales uh, of 20% being generated from products that didn't exist five years ago to always focus on the future and driving forward a uh, performance-oriented culture that relied on discipline and a relentless focus on quality. Our uh, five-year uh, principal mission goals then were to improve our retail experience to satisfy customers, build dominant brands to achieve industry greatness, increase franchisee profitability, and deliver annual profit commitments to enrich all stakeholders. Our performance against these goals was strong and afforded me the opportunity to retire at the uh, end of 03 at age 58. And uh, i just share with you briefly what I consider to be my most significant accomplishments uh, over the year. First and most of, important of which is marrying my current wife and final wife, Linda, that Jeff pointed out. So Linda, if you just want to raise your hand again. Uh, Along with Linda raising two fine young sons, one of whom is a teacher in the Bronx. Uh, he's 25. Our younger son is a senior at St. Lawrence, also in upstate New York. Uh, I also put on the list, you know, being a good son, uh, father, brother. I think that's important. On the business side, it's rejuvenating the Dunkin' Donuts concept and accelerating growth. Uh, it's driving the business from a donut-oriented business to a coffee business, revitalizing the Dunkin' brand, pioneering the multi-brand strategy, 
and providing post 9-11 critical leadership. And I'll just digress for one moment. Uh, about 15 of us were scheduled to be on American Flight 108, which crashed into the World Trade Center <coughs> on September 11th. <coughs> Excuse me, about two weeks before that, we changed uh, the meeting. The reason that we were scheduled to be on that flight, we had a vice president's meeting scheduled for uh, Glendale, California, uh, a suburb of LA where Baskin was headquartered. At the last minute, we decided to change the meeting to Boston. So I was actually leading a meeting in Boston when uh, the tragedy occurred. So our immediate concern was to get people home that were on the road. We had about four or 500 people in our organization in remote locations. And as you may or may not recall, planes weren't flying. Uh, we had to get those people home safely. We were also concerned about a large population of our franchisees who were of Indian and Pakistani descent and concerned about a backlash uh, because they may be identified uh, having had some of the characteristics or physical characteristics of the terrorists. So we went right away to equipping them with the tools to confront uh, and blunt any backlash. And lastly, equipping the firefighters and police officers at Ground Zero with free coffee and donuts for the days and weeks and months while Ground Zero was being uh, addressed. So I'd also uh, like to share with you some of the mistakes that I made along the way because I think it's important to reflect on, uh, reflect on these and I think oftentimes we learn more from our mistakes than we do from our successes. So one was, I mentioned earlier, my arrogance in the reporting relationship with Bob Rosenberg. I think I also was too tough uh, on franchisees. I had a need, I guess, to offset what I thought was Bob's too gentle approach and sort of restore the balance of power. And I think I could have done that more smoothly and diplomatically. Uh, again, not collaborative enough in relationships and uh, I developed an alcohol dependency along the way as well, uh, which I've subsequently addressed uh, attending the uh, assisted recovery center here in, uh, in Savannah. And lastly, I'd say uh, I had the ready, fire, aim approach. I was not reluctant to make decisions. I think that's being decisive is important. I think you need to balance that appropriately with a little bit of process so that uh, judgments can be, can be balanced. And finally, to close the loop on the Duncan story, around the end of 05, about two years after I retired, Allied was acquired by Pernod, a French liquor company that put Duncan, Baskin, and Togo's up for sale and sold it two months later for $2.45 billion dollars or about eight times the price that Allied paid for Duncan 15 years previously. So the good news is I'm enjoying retirement. I'm on two corporate boards and uh, my golf handicap is now down to 13, although that didn't reflect itself when I played with Jim and Jeff and uh, Dr. Park the other day, but we did have a great time. And lastly, if I were to uh, be so bold as to try to give you some uh, unsolicited advice, I would say, you know, and you heard this from Jim as well, remember the NWOL, not without labor. Embrace diversity, be open to learning from all sources. As I got older, as I mentioned, I learned that I could uh, learn a lot from our children and younger folks as well as our elders. I think being balanced is important, not only focusing on your business and your career, but your family, your community. Follow your passion, as Jim also indicated. Be principled. Integrity was up there for a reason on the principled. Someone once said to me, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. I think that's an important message to remember. And lastly, have fun. You only go around once. This is not a dress rehearsal. So thank you for your time and your patience. And Jim and I will look forward to any questions that you might have. Thanks a lot.